All right, line R2, we are in learning task two, which is now gonna be determine our device requirements. So installation uh, requirements for devices are gonna vary based upon what the actual device is designed to do, the environment that it's going to go and be in, et cetera, but we are always gonna have some things that are gonna be constants. You know, the fact that we need to attach conductors to it, that we need to go and have a proper path for bonding, and that we are gonna to need to go and have conductors that are gonna be the correct sizes for inside of these. <coughs> However, before we even begin the whole installation process, let's start with the legalities of it. We are not allowed to just go around installing electrical components all over the place. All of our electrical components are always going to need to be done underneath the permit. There's very few things here in the province of BC that you're allowed to do without a permit. Basically, it boils down to changing out switches and replacing ballasts and lamps. That's about it. Anything after that is going to require a permit. I know that the electrical industry as a whole does not uh, pull nearly the same number of permits as jobs that it does inside of a given year, but you are supposed to go and have that. It says that electrical contractors or others responsible for carrying out the work shall obtain a permit from the inspection department before commencing work. That means you get the permit before you start the job with respect to any installation, any alteration, any repair or extension of any electrical equipment. And what you have to do is you have to also ask for an inspection as part of that permit. It has to be filed on a form provided by uh, the inspection department at the time the permit is obtained. So not only do you get a permit, but you also request that they come in and check up on what you are going to go and do. And then the last thing states that a copy of the permit shall be posted in a conspicuous place at the work site and shall not be removed until the inspection is completed. You do need to have a copy that is always going to be posted so that anybody, not just the inspector, uh, the electrical inspector, but you know, civil inspectors or anybody should be able to walk up and say, yep, yeah, this is a legal job that is there. There is also another uh, thing here on plans and specs. Plans and specs are supposed to be submitted to the inspection department. That's going to be Technical Safety BC here in uh, our province. Uh, by the owner or the agent to an acceptance obtained from the inspection department before work is commenced. And you have to submit plans if it is going to be public buildings, an industrial establishment, factory, or other buildings in which public safety is involved. So if the public is going to be involved inside of that building, stores or anything like that, plans are supposed to be submitted. Large light and power installations and apparatus such as generators, transformers, switchboards, etc., or any other such installations as may be prescribed by the inspection department. This is all in there so that they have an idea what they're coming into. They can also do a little bit of pre-looking at the job before they actually get there, and then they're going to be able to come back to it. This last permit that's talked about over here is the current permit. Uh, current permit is going to be the last section of a job where you have finished the installation and now you're asking for connection power to be applied to it. Uh, there has to be a current permit. A current permit is going to be a pass that comes from the inspection department. So the inspection department, we apply for a permit and ask them to inspect. We notify them that we're ready for the inspection. They do the inspection. And then once they've done that, they issue the current permit. And then the current permit authorizes the supply of electric energy. We submit that then into BC Hydro and then BC Hydro can go and connect power to it. Until that has happened, um, no reconnection, installation, alteration, or addition shall be connected to any service or source of electric energy by a supply authority or electric contractor or other person. You are not allowed to be hooking up, building a installation that's just running that thing off of a generator because that is considered to be a source of electric energy. It still needs to go and be an inspected type of installation. All right. Uh, moving on in the module over here, they talk about wiring methods. Obviously, we've dealt with the wiring methods, you know, a number of times already. We've looked at, you know, a ton of code on installations for different types of conductors. We've looked at different tables that we can go and pull stuff out. We have all of our 19 tables and our D1 tables and, you know, tables 11 and 12 and all the rest of these that are going to be based upon the installation itself help us select the type of wiring. We also know that we can go and select the size of our wiring, our AWG. We've done lots of that as well this year where we have sized conductors out of our tables 
uh, one through four, depending on whether it's copper or aluminum. And we have done so out of the temperature columns based upon whether or not we've got this, you know, 60 or 75 degree or 90 degree equipment. And whether if we don't have it rated, then we use those 406 uh, rules. All of that, we're not going to go over again. We have you know, seen a ton of it already. So wiring methods, you understand how to get your conductors, I hope at this point, how to size inside of a conduit as well. I hope once again at this point, we're gonna just talk about some of the other components that are coming up inside of here. Torque levels, you should be familiar with where you're gonna go and find your torque settings inside of the Canadian Electrical Code. That's gonna be all the way down in the back. I'm just rolling over to my Appendix D here on the side. And if I get there in a second, just let me, roll through there it's a lot of tables and stuff to roll through still rolling still scrolling all right appendix d uh if i go into my appendix d it's going to give me tables d6 and tables d7 these are going to be recommended tightening torques that are going to be based upon the size of the conductors and the size of the lugs that we are going to go and have so if i go up here to my d6 first D6 is going to say this is the recommended tightening torque. Now note that it's recommended. In other words, this is what we go to unless the manufacturer has specified anything different. So if I have got a wire binding screw, it's going to be, you know, 14 through 10 gauge wire. It's going to be 1.4 newton meters that I'm going to go and tighten that thing down. If it's connected with a slotted screw and I've got anything all the way up to number two, I'm going to go and use these torque values. And so we basically can go through the type of connection we have and then the torque value that we should be tightening those uh, for external drive wrenches versus internal, et cetera. And then going down into, you know, table D7 is going to be screws. And once again, you know, the size that are, they're going to be used with and the tightening torque or connecting hardware. If I'm using bolts to tie stuff together, these are the torques that I should be using all of those. These are standards. Um, these are not an eyeballed thing. I know that some of you probably tighten stuff down based upon the number of grunts, you know, like it's kind of a <clears throat> one grunt, you know, that should be tight enough or maybe two grunts, but it's not a by feel thing inside of our code. If you over tighten conductors, it is just as bad as under tightening conductors. You deal with pressure, you deal with cracking once you start dating, you know, temperatures that are going to go through a complete yearly cycle cold in the winter, hot in the summer, uh, you're going to increase the amount of pressure under those lugs and you can actually crack some of those lugs. Uh, if you've ever worked around uh, commercial supplies, you probably have once or twice seen a cracked lug where it's just been over tightened and somebody has split it or they've stripped it or things like that. So don't over tighten them. You lead to stripping and splitting. Under tightening, you lead to arcing. That's why we've got these tar charts so you can tighten them correctly. Talking about switches then, um, Disconnect switches, we need to make sure that we are terminating our conductors into the proper side of those. There's a couple rules that I want to go and take a look at. The first one that we're going to go into is going to be inside of my section 14. And it's going to be 14. And we're going to roll to 14404. So just about there. Control devices ahead of overcurrent devices. So this is where we've got a fusible disconnect. This fusible disconnect has got a control device that's going to be the switch that's going to be ahead of the over uh, current device that's going to be the fuse. It says control devices used in conjunction with overcurrent devices. We're talking about a fusible disconnect or overload devices for the control of circuits or apparatus shall be connected so that the overcurrent or overload device will be dead when the control device is in the open position, except where this is impracticable. What this is talking about is it is talking about my fusible disconnect. I'm going to go and have lugs that are going to be on the top side. We then move down into here's my knife blade contact. Here's going to be my actual blade. And from there, I move down into another set of fuse holders. And then I'm going to have another set of lugs down here at the bottom. The fuses go in across over there through the fuse holders. This is going to have to be my line side. This is going to have to be my load side so that when I open the switch, that fuse is going to go and be dead. If you've ever pulled out large scale fuses before, you know that those things are stuck in there tight and that they're usually going to require you to, you know, pretty much wrap your entire hand around it. You should be using proper fuse pullers to go and take them out, but not everybody has that. Not everybody can afford, you know, $14, I guess. Uh, but uh, you should be using the proper fuse pullers to, to remove these things. 
If not, if you do have to remove them by hand, this is going to be safe because we've disconnected the line. It would be illegal to go and bring the line into the bottom and take the load out the top. Yes, I get that the switch can operate and interrupt current, and I get that the overcurrent device, the fuse, will also be able to operate. But if I go and open the switch over here and go to remove that, this is still going to be live over here. So that's my uh, 14404. There's another one as well that is very similar to this that we're going to find inside of section six, and it's the crisscross rule. It's actually a relatively new rule that we are going to go and have. We're going to go into six, which is going to be with services and service equipment. And this is applicable to service equipment, not general equipment, but just to service equipment. Two, two, one, twelve. <clears throat> Consumer service conductors that enter a service box that is not equipped with a barrier between the line and the load sign. So you know how inside of your panels, you've got that barrier that is in between the actual circuit breaker and the rest of the conductors. We don't have that on every type of service entrance. If we're dealing with a fusible disconnect, fusible disconnects will not have that. In that case, the consumer service conductors have to enter the service box as close as possible to the line terminals of the main switch or circuit breaker and they are not allowed to come into contact with or to cross conductors connected to the load terminals of the main switch or circuit breaker. What that looks like is this. Let's draw that one real quick. If this is my fusible disconnect, here's my handle. Handles are almost always on the right hand. It's a right-handed person's world. I'm sorry if you're left-handed, but that's just the way that these things are drawn. You're going to go and have your lugs up at the top. Then there's going to be the actual blades. And then you're going to go and have your fuses down here. So I'm just going to draw that fuses down here. So there's my actual lugs. What you are not allowed to do is feed in your line conductors from, let's say, down here and run them up top like that. Okay. And at the same time, have your load conductors. We're going to draw those in as green. You know, maybe those are coming into here and they're crisscrossing or going past the lugs. This would be termed as an illegal installation because if for whatever reason there was a large enough fault inside there, these line conductors and these load conductors, because they're crossed over top of each other, could go and melt and bond to each other. If this has happened. This is why that we have a rule. Generally speaking, when we see new rules in the code book, it is because something out there has failed so spectacularly Usually it's a contractor that's failed so spectacularly. Uh, but something out there has failed so spectacularly that we just have to write it down as a rule so that we don't have run to that issue again. So this would be illegal to go and have my load crossing over past my lines inside of here. Don't do that. What we should do instead is we are going to go and remove these ones over here. We'll remove those ones over there. Just take them in separately take my line in up top over here take my load in down over there and then you're going to be fine for these ones just make sure that those conductors are not crisscrossing inside of there that once again you have to know about that one because that's a new one and something that they're looking for at this point six two one two sub three uh, they shall not come in contact with or cross conductors connected to the low terminals of the main switch or circuit breaker. Once again, this is only to do with services. This is not to do with subfeed. So if you've got your main services coming to the building, you've distributed down all the way to your splitter, and then now you are going to go and take from that splitter and run out, you know, to a bunch of other loads, those ones, they could crisscross all they want. This is all to do because it's in section six. It's all to do with consumers service conductors. Cool. Okay. Um, then there's a brief little bit about the wiring of capacitors. We've talked about, you know, the fact that they need to have that 135% for their inrush on all of their different components. We had a little bit there on the wiring as well on them. That's going to be section 26 200's rules. We're not going to go into that one because we did cover that fairly uh, thoroughly. Um, Yeah, we'll talk about this whole knockout thing that's over there. We have a thing here that is a set of pictures to do with some knockouts. We've got knockouts on the side of a disconnect over here. These are going to be my center. We call the center one over here the KO, the knockout. And then we call these other rings over here, generally speaking, the twist outs. 
By the way, for those of you that struggle at removing these twist outs without breaking out, you know, the larger ring, and I know some of you probably have done that before. You're trying to twist out, let's say maybe this one over here that you need to remove, but you're not able to get it out. What you need to do is you need to go and sever that. So if I were to go and remove this, I'm going to take my screwdriver. Everybody should have that one big flat uh, screwdriver, the beaten driver that you hammer on. I would drive this one out. I would grab this and instead of bending it back and forth, I would twist it. Okay, because it's got just that little tab right over there that I'm trying to go and break off. I would twist that, I would fully remove that. Then what I would do is I would insert my screwdriver. You'll see that this ring over here has got a tab here and a tab over there. What I would do then is I would take my screwdriver and I would just give a little tap right there, ting, and give another little tap right there, ting, and just bend those two up just a tiny little bit, get a little bit of leverage underneath there and just crown them a little bit and then go on the inside with your side cutters and cut this ring and cut this ring over here as well okay you just want to sever that ring because at that point you're going to have these two half moon shapes you can then bend up each of these half moon shapes one at a time and then twist them rotate and twist them not just like bend them out of the way and you'll get clean knockout removals all the time some of you have struggled with you know this and you take out too large of a knockout or maybe you just misjudge which knockout you're supposed to be using and then you have to go to these things which are called reducing washers there's a big difference between a reducing washer and a reducing bushing. Reducing bushings uh, are going to be this thing that is going to be threaded on the outside and then threaded on the inside. And it's going to have a cross section. It's going to look something like this. And what it is, is we can thread that in. We can thread this thing into a one inch and then we can reduce it down to like a half inch or something like that. That is referred to as a reducing bushing or reducing sleeve uh, sometimes but it is a way for us to go and have threaded in components. Reducing washers are different than that. These are just pinched in between. So if I've got my actual knockout hole over here, we'll look at this thing from a side view. What I would do with the reducing uh, washers is those reducing washers kind of get pinched in and across like that. Now their connection is not great. And as a result of that, we are not allowed to go and utilize them as a form of bonding. We have to go and have something else that is going to go and be a separate form of bonding. Let's go into section 10, which is our grounding and bonding. We looked at 10 already this year, but we'll go into 10. We'll roll down into 10606. Bonding continuity. And bonding continuity at other than service equipment. So there's two types of bonding. We've got bonding at the service equipment. Bonding at the service equipment was really important because the fault current is going to travel along the bond path and try to get back to the main service, BC Hydro service, which might have a massive overcurrent on it. So we've got some extra beefy bonding that's going to go and happen up top there. But then for our, anything other than the service equipment, so basically all the rest of our equipment, we're allowed to have lesser bonding because we're going to have smaller sizes of systems. And uh, sub-rule two of that says reducing washers and note that it says washers shall not be used to maintain the bonding continuity of a wiring system. We are allowed to go and use the bushings. We are not allowed to go and use the washers. The code explicitly disallows the washers. Um, when you do enter them inside there, your binder talks a little bit about the amount of free conductor. You should be very familiar with this one because that's the one that lets you put enough wire in the box that you're able to make the splices. One or two of you in this class probably got a boss that's cheap enough that they're always like, not so long on the tails, make those shorter. And uh, that's fine if you know, maybe you're know you putting out two foot tails or something like that, that would be crazy talk. But uh, you are always gonna be allowed to go and have, excuse me, that 150 uh, millimeters. If I go down to my section 12, I'm gonna go work my way up in section 12. It's easier than working my way down. I'm gonna go to rule 12, 3000. Twelve three thousand states that at least 150 millimeters of free insulated conductor shall be left at each outlet. When they say outlet over here, they do not mean receptacles. They mean at places where the wire can be pulled out of the actual um, wiring system. So an outlet would be a box inside of the system. It's where we can get wires out of the system. There has to be at least 150 millimeters unless the insulated conductors are intended to loop through lamp holders, receptacles, or similar devices without joints. 
we don't do that very often where you can loop around a screw or anything like that. Almost everything is done with our pigtails. All right. Um, yeah, that's it for the knockouts and for that little bit that they had on the wiring. Let's talk about the environmental characteristics. So we've got different classes of switches. NEMA type 1, 3R4, 4X5, uh, and NEMA 12s that are shown inside of this picture, which are just increasingly strong and impossible to get, you know, stuff in and out of components, you know, where it's going to get all the way up into us having waterproof types of switches that are going to be locked down, etc. These ones over here, there's lots of gaps. These ones over here, a lot less gaps that we're going to have. These ones over here are NEMA 1, we're going to go and have knockouts. These ones over here, we're going to go and thread in through hubs. And in a lot of cases, the actual category is going to require you to only enter through the bottom. Uh, because the manufacturer doesn't want to go and take the risk of you cutting too big of a hole and then claiming that their switch wasn't waterproof or something. So read that documentation if you're working with waterproof stuff. But anytime you're working weatherproof, always come up from the bottom rather than down from the top. It's just way easier to drain stuff out than it is to deal with trying to stop it from getting in. Where does the code talk about this? Once again, back in the very front of your code book, if we roll into 2400, right near the very end of my section two, talks about enclosure types and designations. So for the purposes of the code, the following designations are recognized. And it talks about table type one, two, three, four, five, you know, et cetera, inside of here. Um, and then it says other enclosure types tabulated in table 65 shall be permitted to be substituted for those required in sub rule one. So sub rule one gives us the basics over here. If we go into that table 65, then we are going to go and see a whole pile of other ones inside of here. And they're going to give us, you know, just different things. Like if I have got external formation of ice, I'm going to roll through here until I find something that tells me I need a 3S or a 3X. That's the type that's going to be good for ice. You'll note that ones like that are submersible aren't because the seals would compromise with external ice buildup or things like that. So it's very much application specific that you're going to go into here. You are also going to go and have some little notes that are going to be on here. You know, that they're going to go and say these, you know, here's a 12 with its asterisk. That means it's a 12 without knockouts that I'm allowed to go and use inside of these ones here. Whereas, you know, 12 with knockouts, I obviously would not be allowed. So it's just different types of ratings off of these ones. There's also, if we go back to that same rule, 2400, over there. So it said those designations over there, uh, other enclosure types tabulated in table 65 is uh, shall be permitted to be substituted for those required in sub rule one. And then it says any other types of enclosures for in uh, use in hazardous location shall be designated in accordance with rule 18052. So there's a whole other section with hazardous locations. We'll cover that heavily inside of fourth year. At this point inside a second, that's too far away. So we'll deal with that then. I do want to go back to this one over here where it talks about offers a degree of protection. What they're talking about over here is actually what we would refer to as ingress protection. And you're going to have to go and do a little bit of an Appendix B hunt over here right now. We're going to go to Section 18 inside of our Appendix B, and we're going to roll down through Section 18 till we get to the note for 18102. There's lots of 18 rules and charts. So look at that. There's tables full of fun things, temperatures. Too far. B185 is what the table is that you're going to need to have. I would probably make a note just to yourself which table that this thing is on, but it's in your section 18 and it is going to go and give me my IP ratings over here. You've picked up lights before that are going to be, you know, IP56 maybe or things like that. What those IP ratings are is they tell us about the amount of dust protection and the amount of water protection. And it's always laid out in order that these things are going to go and be. Um, I don't know if it says it down below here or if it was up above. It's the one above there, I think, where they talk about it. So let me just roll up just a little bit over here. Uh, type of protection, increased you know, safety, incorporates protection from ingress of water, etc. And then it talks a little bit about the IP. The ingress protection, highlight this section of your code book. Ingress protection describes the degree of protection an enclosure provides. The first number describes the degree of protection against physical contact, solids. The second protects against liquids. 
So if it's at 54, it's protected against solids all the way down to dust size. Now obviously, fingers can't get into it if it can keep out dust, but anything smaller than dust could go and get into. Uh, you know, same with the four, tells us to protect against water splashing, not necessarily jets of water. Moving down onto the next page over here, once again, this is going to be my ratings. So if I've got an IP4, an IP that starts with the number four means that it is going to have objects greater than one millimeter, it can block out. But really fine objects could, you know, work their way into it. And so it might be like a 4-1, which would tell me that it would be fine if water was dripping vertically onto it, but, you know, not uh, splashing at it. So this might be something where you've got like a little bit of ventilation slots on the bottom. Small objects that are, you know, one millimeter and uh, smaller could get in and stuff dripping from the top would be fine, but not, you know, if it's splashing, etc. That's your IP tables. Just be aware of those ones and where they are. Obviously, we can go with an overprotection for all of these. If we go back into our section two or into our table 65, they're going to go and tell us that, I'll just roll right back to that section two here. Um, it shall be recognized as for these places and then It just has to be suitable for anything that's that's going to be greater. So if you go to a greater use or one that's going to be a little bit more strong, you're obviously going to be allowed to place into an area that is going to be less protection. And you see that inside of your table 65. Oh, by the way, here's the other thing on the IP where it states that anything inside of here, we can use those IP designations. If I go into my table 65, I see that absolutely a submersible. My strongest case that I have over here is a submersible or a 6P type of a uh, of rating that I would have on those switches. This thing can be fine submersible. It can keep out water, so it's gonna be fine against you know falling dirt. It's gonna be fine against accidental contact, you know, settling dust and lint and fibers. We can use it in lots of different places. So you're usually better off to be a little bit overprotected, a little bit past what the rating is, rather than you know, obviously being under, which you're not allowed to be. Okay, that's my switches that I'm going to go and have over there. Orientation, we're not going to talk much about the orientation of switches. Obviously, every device does have an up or down. You should know where your orientations are for things like receptacles and switches or where to go and find that inside of your code book. Polarity is going to be an important thing though. Polarity is going to be which one is the line and which one is going to be the neutral. On a transformer, we talked about this, XO indicates that we have got a neutral point. If I have got an L versus a T, anything that is rated with an L1 is going to be for a line number one that it would be. Anything that is rated for a T1 would be rated for the load side. So if you have got a component that has got Ls and Ts, you need to identify those as being line side versus load side. L1, T1 indicates it's the same line, but one of these is going to be the incoming, the other is gonna be my outgoing sign. Um, polarity for receptacles, you would have covered this earlier this year. I know I've already asked you to go in and find your receptacles before. That's going to be found underneath your diagrams. So appendix, uh, oops, sorry, not appendix, but diagrams. Sometimes I say appendix D. Diagrams come right after the tables. So it goes tables, then diagrams, then your appendixes. Here's your diagrams for these. You'll see every single one of these. And what we're going to have is we've got a G and a W. That is going to be listed on here. I know G and W, it seems a little bit counter to what we have, but except as noted above, G represents the terminal for bonding to ground. W represents the identified terminal. Identified meaning that if you go back into section four, that means neutral that we would go and have. They're saying green and white off of them. The X, Y, and Z represent the terminals for ungrounded conductors. So anything that we are going to go and have labeled with those is ungrounded. Uh, and if you go down to the next one over here, this is going to be CSA configuration for locking receptacles. We call these our twist lock families. Exact same thing, W, X, Y, or X, Y, Z, and then my white, and then my G for green for my bonding conductor over there. The one thing that you need to be very, very careful about with these ones is that Z on a three-phase system because Really just the way that they laid it out, they should have probably done ABC for the lines or AB or something like that because WXY 
where X, Y, Z all kind of runs in a row. And if you're anything like me, you know, you kind of associate those things together. So if I've got W, X, Y, like that, um, and I don't know what I'm doing, I can go and make some, you know, core connections. Because I might assume that these would be, you know, line one, two, and three, or something like that. Or, you know, W and X is going to be my line, etc. Where this becomes a big problem is on the three phase ones where we have got the Z. Because any time that we have got the letter Z, these things, we can pick them up in our hands, we can rotate them, etc. And there's this issue, oh, come on, it's frozen up inside of there, where if I take a Z and I rotate that Z by 90 degrees, that Z looks like a big old N, okay? When you are looking at those terminals, when you're holding a receptacle in your hand, if you're rotating it around, you can definitely, I have seen it done before, it's always catastrophic because that means that they would be putting a line onto what should be the neutral and they'd be putting a neutral onto what should be a line. I have seen this happen before where people will go and read that receptacle or that cordant and they're going to read that Z as being an N because they looked at it sideways. One of my pet peeves with the way that these things are labeled. Instead of W, X, Y, Z, they probably would have been better to have like A, B, C or something like that. Oh, too late to change it, just to watch this yourself. The other thing that you should be able to go and identify for polarity off of them though, is just gonna be your screw colors. Everybody should be familiar with this. A silver screw is gonna be my neutral connection or my identified connection that I'm going to go and have. Brass screws are going to go and be my line connections that I'm going to go and have. So you can read all of those uh, and pick up you know, that information from that as well. Okay, uh, location, talking about locations inside of um, the, the, uh, places that have got prints and things like that. If there is anything that has been specified in the prints and manuals, obviously you're going to go and have to go and follow that. Some other stuff is just kind of known that you're going to go and have stuff in certain configurations. One of the big ones that is known is going to be your main disconnects, your incoming service and your incoming service always needs to be as close as possible to where we are bringing our lines into the building. We're gonna to go to 6206 over here. 6206, subrule one, subrule C. Uh, service boxes or other consumer service equipment, so whatever your panel is or your main switch, they need to be placed in such a way uh, Place within the building being served as close as practicable to the point where the consumer service conductors enter the building. We're not allowed to go and enter the building with our service conductors and then run all the way out and across. It has to be as tight in as possible. Other disconnects, we don't have as much that we need to be as worried about for most of them unless it's for specific types of equipment. A lot of specific equipment is going to go and require that the disconnects are going to be within sight of and accessible motors. Uh, capacitors, things like that, because if somebody is working on some of those dangerous pieces of equipment, they want you to be able to, as an electrician, you know, keep that under watch, so that you can walk, or you can see if somebody walks over, is like, well, I should turn this switch back on or something, we'd obviously want to go and stop them. So those are going to be uh, location-wise, but then the other one is going to be, once again, that 14100 rule, location and disconnect switches, what we talked about before, because we get to go and rate it to the size of the switch. If we're going to do a switch, we can have our conductors rate it to the size of the switch as long as we keep them under three meters. This is going to be a critical place. It's just going to be sub-distribution that you want to keep those disconnects as tight as possible to the actual splitters. Don't worry, you'll have loads of practice on these things with all the um, self or with all of the uh, CEC worksheets. Okay, uh, power factor correction capacitors, because this is second year, a lot of the uh, <coughs> locations that they're talking about in here are really to do with the stuff that we have covered this year. So talking about the power factor correction capacitors, we can locate them at the motors. We talked about that in the previous video there very briefly, that we want to go and keep them as tight as possible to the motors, and we don't need to have a separate disconnecting means if it's a motor correction capacitor. We're allowed to just you know, disconnect it with the motor, etc., Otherwise, we're going to try and keep them either directly at large loads, like big motors, 50 horse and larger. We're going to place the cap at the motor, uh, or we're going to place them at our main services, in a lot of other cases, and inside of large capacitor banks. We're not going to go and, you know, 
deal with sizing or locating those so much because that's such an individualistic thing based upon what each installation itself it, uh, looks like. Okay, let's roll into the next section over here. Um, finishes. They talk about, you know, the finishing stage is really where we are going to go and have all of our covers, all of our trims and things like that. They do talk about the fact you can get back charges if you do not clean up. If we're at finishing stage, you know, this is where everybody is actually carrying their garbage out to the dumpster every day. Most good job sites do require that. A lot of smaller ones don't. So make sure you're doing that so you avoid those back charges. Those do happen in industry. Um, and then an important part of the finishing is going to be my labeling identification and labeling. Let's go and take a look at section two once again, and we're going to go into 2100. <clears throat> at the time of installation, each service box shall be marked in conspicuous, legible, and permanent manner to clearly indicate the maximum rating of the overcurrent device. So you have to put in the size of the fuses that they are going to be used for that. And then at each distribution point, any place where we send current out, circuit breakers, fuses, and switches shall be marked adjacent thereto in a conspicuous and legible manner to clearly identify which installation or portion of installation they protect or control. And the maximum rating of the overcurrent device that is permitted. The maximum rating of the overcurrent device, we don't usually write that in the panel led uh, labels because that's gonna be the circuit breaker handle itself that covers that. Usually what we're looking for is just, this is where we are going to go and have this, you know, this controls the hall lights or it's the bathroom receptacles or something like that. It is only required out of the code that we go and label the distribution point. On larger job sites, commercial ones, oftentimes there's gonna be labeling that's gonna go and happen at every single one of your receptacles, all the way through there. You know, every light switch, et cetera, they wanna go and have the circuits identified, you know, for ease of maintenance. Just because if on a large one, you can't have people flipping stuff on and off. You know, if it's a breaker that you're just flipping on and off inside of a prison system, Oops, you just turned off, you know, the electronic door locks or something. That's going to be bad. Or if it's for inside of a hospital, you know, you don't want to be shutting down people's uh, heart pumping machines and things like that. So we just need to have extra labeling in those cases. But your actual job specs will at that point tell you what you need to go and have labeled. Where do you find those specs? The specs are going to be found inside of your manuals. You do have this thing called master format that is out there. Master format is this... Um, it's global wide actually more than just Canada wide but it's this standardization of prints so that anybody can find stuff on a print knowing that you know normally it's going to be found in this section or that section etc master format is going to go and have a division number nine which is going to go and deal with finishes that will tell you about any sort of labeling on there we do have our own section uh, which is section 26, that's gonna be our electrical one. But then there's a bunch of other ones that are also gonna be inside there. We're gonna take a look at those on the next, well, no, let's just go flip over to there on the next page. If you go over to your next page over there, they do talk about the different divisions. We don't really need to worry about things like, you know, the landscape, unless we've got landscape lights out there or a bunch of these other ones. But the ones that are pertinent to us, division one, which is gonna be our general requirements, you know, job site requirements overall, finishes, Equipments under 11, special constructions, that's going to be if anything needs to be put together in special ways. Oftentimes we will also go and find information under special constructions that are going to have to deal with seismic restraints that we might have. Conveying systems, elevators, escalators, things like that, that are going to require electrical power. Fire suppression systems, uh, that's going to be suppression ones that we are looking at. So those are ones that actually shut it off. We're going to have some pumps that are going to be part of that, uh, sometimes CO ones as well. Plumbing, there's a lot of plumbing stuff that interfaces with electrical. HVAC, obviously even more stuff that interfaces with the electrical. Integrated automation, this is going to be your building DDC systems that are going to go and run it. 27, which is going to be communications. That's going to be your low voltage CAT5, things like that. That's going to be placed out there. And then section 28, which is going to be security and safety. So that's going to be security systems as well as life safety systems like your fire detection systems. All of those are just, you know, areas of the spec that you should be familiar with. You do not find all of your information inside of the electrical one. I know we think we're super important on a job site, uh, but we're just one out of many trades out there. And so sometimes we have to look in their sections as well to get the rest of the information that we need. Um, okay, going back into what we had over here, they talk about bonding. Uh, bonding, we've done stuff out of section 10, grounding and bonding extensively before there. 
The big thing out of bonding that you need to be aware of, um, or that most people struggle with on bonding, is sizing of a bonding conductor. The ground conductor is pretty straightforward. It's usually always going to go and be a number six that we are going to go and utilize. But the bond is going to be different. What is the purpose of the bond again? The purpose of the bond is to deliver current back from out on the system over to the main neutral, where it can then get back to the supply transformer. So it is going to carry a lot of current. The actual ground conductor that goes to the electrode carries very, very little current, if ever, any sort of current. Because it's pretty unlikely that we're actually going to drive a conductor down into the dirt and you know run it through the dirt. But it's very common that we're going to drive a conductor onto the bond, you know, a piece of metal or something like that. So the bond has to be larger than number six because the bond is going to be the current that is going to get carried back, or it's going to be the conductor that's going to carry current back to the circuit breaker. And it has to be sized large enough that it's going to have a low resistance so that we can get lots of current to trip out the breaker as well. Two ways that we size the bond. We have to size them out of whichever is going to go and be greater. So you're going to go and say, hey, do I have a breaker or a conductor that has more impacity? Let's go and talk about this column over here first, the ampacity of the overcurrent device. Think about your heaters. We've done those this year. We saw that we could go and have a heater that was a uh, our heating circuit where we could have a breaker that was 30 amps, but that the actual conductors were going to be number 12s. So if I were to go and look at that, I would say 30 is my largest one that I'm going to go and have. So yes, the conductors are number 12, the breaker, is going to be good for 30 amps, so I'm going to go to the larger one of those two. All you got to do is look for which one's bigger. I'd go to the 30, and then I would be able to say I need to have a bond that is going to be at least a number 12 if it's going to be copper, or a number 10 if it's going to go and be aluminum. Buses over here for square actual busways. We'll leave that alone because that's a really in, uh, industrial type of application. The other thing that sometimes happens though is well, we're going to go and have conductors that are going to go and be larger. Uh, this is a really common thing where let's talk about a 200 amp service. So to have a 200 amp service, I'm going to need to have conductors that are good for at least 200 amps. So I'm going to say, let's say I've got a 200 amp switch. I'm going to feed it with aluminum conductors. That would require me out of the 75 table to go and use a 250 aluminum. I'm actually just going to roll up there because I think this is important that you see this. Do, 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 do. Okay. 75 degree column, I have to have 200 amps, so it's going to be this one, my 250 MCM. 250 MCM is actually rated for 205 amps, which means that when I go down into my table 16 again, when I'm looking at this, I'm going to have 200 amp fuses, but I'm going to have conductors that are 205 amps. Once again, which is larger? 200 amp fuses, 205 amp conductors. The conductors are larger, absolutely. So then I go down here and it says not exceeding. Okay, my 200 to 5 amp conductors, are they exceeding 200? They are. So am I allowed to use it? Absolutely not, because this over here says not exceeding. Highlight that inside of your code book. You need to have that. My 205 amp conductors require that I am going to go and create a bond out of this section over here. If I was looking for an aluminum bond with that, I would have to be using a number 2 aluminum, aluminum for that one. That's probably the number one struggle with bonding. It's just doing that sizing and then identifying, once again, which is bigger, the breaker or the conductor. Whichever one is the larger one, we need to size to that. Okay, supporting uh, boxes. Um, we'll go back into our section number 12 for that one. Back end of section number 12, almost all the way at section number 14, is where we find everything to do with boxes. And we'll just roll through 12 all the way down to the very bottom of that one. Installation of boxes, terminals, cabinets, fittings, etc. If we go into 123010, so 123010. Oops, sorry, I just want to click too far over there. Uh, it says, except as permitted by sub rule six. So there is one case where we don't. But other than that, box and fittings shall be firmly secured to fixed structural units that we have to do, other than wooden, metal, or composition lathe. Lathe is going to be talking about uh, drywall. So we're not allowed to just mount stuff onto drywall, uh, drywall or any other type of wall covering. Any wall covering falls underneath that term of lathe over there. We need to go mount it to something that's structural, the stud, the joist, or something like that. Um, 
Anytime that we've got a box with any dimension greater than 100 millimeters, that's going to be four inches. They shall be secured on at least two sides or shall be secured to metal supports or to wooden boards at least 19 millimeters thick that are rigidly secured to structural units. This is going to be for any of your three gang switches. Even a lot of your two gang switches are more than four uh, inches across. You need to be supporting these things on both sides. I think everybody's run into that before where you get that floppy three gang box or you're trying to like connect something down there and that box is just like sagging back into the wall or it's starting to go and pop back out of the wall as well. In most cases inside of a residential application, what is allowable inside of there, if this is my stud over here, we'll just draw that one. So there's my actual stud wall. And then I'm gonna go and have my box that's gonna be mounted over here like that. I'm gonna call that thing a three gang box. What they will usually allow you to do is just stick on what we refer to as a scab. And that little scab is just gonna be a piece of two by four that hangs on there right now, doesn't do much at this point. But once we actually go and place our wall finish on there, the drywall, that drywall on the front and back of the wall is going to go and pin this piece of wood. So right now during construction, this thing is gonna be floppy. You know, that box is gonna to wanna to bend back and forth inside of the wall. But once we get this thing drywall, that thing is going to keep that so it's not gonna push out or, you know, pull into the wall or anything like that. Um, splitters, yeah, they talk about splitters, that those need to be uh, supported intervals not greater than 1.5 meters. And then luminaires, because we've got a whole section on lighting inside of here as well, there is going to be rules for supporting of lighting that are going to be very much based upon the weight of the lighting. Obviously, if stuff is overhead. You don't want it just kind of falling down on top of people because that kills people and things like that. And that's always a bad time. So we want to make sure that we are going to support it. It says every luminaire shall be securely supported. And then it talks about either heavy or large luminaires. And they do always give us, you know, this whole thing about large as well, because large really just gives us leverage, right? Something can impact it and it can leverage and leverage gives us more force. So anytime that's more than 2.7 kg or 400 millimeters shall it be supported by the screw shell of the lamp holder. We're talking about pendants over here. Anytime that it does not exceed 13 kilograms, it shall be permitted to be supported by a wall outlet box. So we're talking about a 25 pound light over here is allowed to be just hung by a wall outlet box that is attached to the building structure. Anytime that it does not exceed 23 kilograms, that's 50 pounds, the luminaire shall be permitted to be supported by a ceiling outlet box. So we can hang up to 50 pounds of light overhead. <laughs> that is an incredibly heavy light. I don't know that I would want to be running underneath that, but you are allowed to hang it. Uh, for off of a ceiling outlet box. But anytime that the weight of the luminaire prohibits that, so where it's more than 50 pounds overhead or 25 pounds on a wall, then I have to go and support it independently of the fixture box and by a fixture hanger provided with an integral outlet box support. You've probably, if you've done any residential, dealt with some of those high fancy, you know, uh, ceilings where you're going to have to get that fancy ceiling outlet box that's got the extra supports inside of that. Do note as well, this rule over here, rigid PVC boxes shall not be used for the support of luminaires unless they're being marked as being suitable for the purpose. If you've worked with uh, PVC, you know you can heat that stuff up to bend it. Guess what else is hot? A light, which means that you can go and have a customer who puts in a 100 watt you know, bulb and all of a sudden they just soften. They basically, it's like holding a heat gun to that PVC box and the PVC box is gonna get loose and then all of a sudden, dunk, that light comes down, right? So we're not allowed to go and hang stuff off of my PVC boxes over there. The other one that I want to take a look at, uh, just while we're in here, is 3308 and then um, 3308 sub rule 2. One second, there we are. Luminaires weighing more than 4.5 kilograms. So anytime that I have got a light that weighs over top of that, that's going to be about a 10 pounder. They shall be installed so that the branch circuit wiring connections and the bonding connections will be accessible for inspection without removing the luminaire supports. If you've hung, you know, uh, dining room fixtures, they oftentimes are going to be hung off of a chain and then we're going to have a bar that goes across the actual box itself. That's going to go and have the little fixture stud attached to that. The, what, that bar goes up and then you're going to go and slide that cover. That cover should be able to be slid down so that you can actually, you know, inspect and make those connections. We hang the fixture and then we, you know, make the connection. Then we slide that little cover up over top of that. Um, I think that's it for that. I want to go cover. 
Yeah, that's it for, you know, covering on the actual mounting of these things. Be careful with the mounting of lights. Lights in particular, use proper size screws. Don't go too large. Don't just grab a big screw to drive into an outlet box because if you use too large of a screw that cracks the plastic as well, and that's going to be, you know, just as damaging as having an undersized screw. Use the proper rated size for the actual, you know, one that you're going to have. For wall packs, once again as well, I think we mentioned this one before when we were talking about lighting, um, but when we were talking about lighting, if you do have to hang your wall packs, remember that those wall packs themselves are supposed to go and have high temperature conductors inside them. So unless you are planning on cutting off those tails and running them through the fixture, uh, you do have to go and pull them out. So if this is my wall pack, I'm going to take that whole wall pack like this and then what you can do is you can take the ballast connection. So here's my ballast connection. I'm going to take those leads out into the back. I'm going to make that junction inside of here with my regular building 90 degree conductors that are going to be inside of that. If that's not possible and the only way that you can usually do this is usually when I go up to mount one of these, if it's going to be on a concrete one, you're going to go up there, you'll mark above that, you're going to run your hammer drill in, you know, brrr, stick in a anchor and then what I'll do is I'll have a three inch screw. I just have always got one long three inch screw. I call it my temporary screw and it just rides around in kind of that you know pouch puke pouch. Everybody's got one where all the randoms are. I will use that. I'll only drive that in about an inch. That gives me about two and a half inches. It's just a temporary way to hold the light up and then I can swing the light out of the way. I can access these ones and then I can swing the light back over top of that. The other thing that you are allowed to do is you're allowed to go and cut off this conductor and that's sometimes just as easy is to cut off this conductor because it's usually a fairly long conductor. I'm then going to go and take that piece that I cut off and I will marette that piece into this box over here with a regular marette inside there and then I will poke the high temperature conductor through that hole in the back of my wall pack into the wall pack itself and then inside of the wall pack I will use proper high temperature marettes. Those are those black marettes. Those are your high temperature ones and I'll make my connection onto that one. Okay, uh, that is it for what we have to cover out of learning task two. It's a lot of code as we're looking through these things, but uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward.